Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Late Night Learning. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Palomba. Now today, as of this recording, we're about one week from Christmas. And this is kind of the time of the year in which we think of friends, we think of family, and other loved ones. Today, we are privileged to have none other than my mother, Fran. Mom, say hi to the camera. Hi, hello, welcome. All right, right on. So holiday season means a lot of things to us. And before we get to lecture, it's important to kind of reflect upon what the holidays mean to us. So for you, with having me and my siblings growing up, what were some things that you remember? Well, I enjoyed, of course, my children waking up in the morning and ripping through those boxes, those gift boxes. I also enjoyed, maybe not really enjoyed, when my boys wrapped themselves up in a big box and popped out of a big <laughs> box. And that really startled me, and that was my Christmas present when I felt a hand grab my leg out of a box. I happened to put my younger brother, who's actually now bigger than me, into a box and I wrapped him up and I poked holes because I didn't want to kill him. And I put him <laughs> under a tree and uh, my mother did not have the opportunity to open the box. She read a note that was affixed to the present and so when she was reading the letter, Michael burst open, grabbed her leg and screamed Merry Christmas to her. And that was my Merry Christmas morning. That was her Merry <laughs> Christmas morning. It was a pretty good time. Now, since we're talking about the holidays, I can't think of anything else more important aside from gifts than food. Ugh. Food is absolutely a staple of the holiday season. Mom, what are you thinking of making this holiday I'm season? I'm thinking of making a nice prime rib for my family. Mm, how are you preparing that prime rib? I'm preparing it with seasonings like thyme and mm. bay leaf mm -hmm. and a little salt and pepper overnight. And then it's going into the oven mm -hmm. with sweet potatoes. Yum. Now, aside from the food and the gifts, usually the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning on Christmas or on Hanukkah or any other holiday during this time of year, we go for the stockings. What are you putting in stockings? Well, we can't put like the little sugar canes and the little toys. We've had to upgrade. So I can't tell you because mm. it's still a surprise, but we've had to upgrade to adulthood. Yeah. And I have been very creative. So it's a surprise. It's going to blow your mind, actually. It's going to blow our mind. My mm -hmm. mind. Your mm -hmm. mind. Everybody's mind. Yes. Awesome and amazing. So let's get into the lecture itself. Now, today we're going to be talking about advertising and public relations, Mom. In yeah. your mind, what does advertising mean to you? Advertising means to me something of importance to share with others, to draw them in of what you are trying to sell or that you have an interest in. Yeah, she's pretty much right. The notion that companies try to work with strategic communication teams and other areas of a department to get a sense of how to better communicate with the public surrounding a particular product or service. Advertising is paid commercial time. So we're thinking of billboards, we're thinking of commercials, we're thinking of paid magazine spreads, newspapers, and things like that. Now, differently, we have public relations. Does anything strike you when I say public relations? Relationships with others. Yeah, that kind of hits on it. Public relations is a really, really abstract, even esoteric well, term. Building, developing yeah. relationships with others. Sharing community, mm -hmm. communications, sharing information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're hitting it on the head. Maybe I should give this to you. Maybe. Maybe. So with public relations, it is this idea of non-traditional paid communication. And so we're thinking about Twitter. We're thinking about social media, the uh, late night TV shows in which an actor or an actress comes on to talk about a new TV show or a new movie. That's actually public relations at work, not necessarily advertising. So what I'd like to leave you with is it is the holiday season. It's important to love your loved ones. Mom, do you have anything else to say to the camera? I'm wishing you a happy, merry Christmas, a happy season, joy and peace. Excellent. Let's get back to lecture. Wasn't that great meeting my mother? I'm still laughing about that story myself. It's very difficult to package a heart attack as a gift for the holiday season. So we came pretty close, my brother and I, with having my brother pop out of the box itself. Now, let's get started with late night learning and let's learn about advertising and public relations. So with advertising and public relations, they are two separate forms of strategic communication. Now, there are a lot of different terms for uh, what advertising means and what public relations means. And a lot of people have different definitions. But as I went over with my mother earlier, advertising is a paid form of communication. Billboards, TV commercials, radio ads, magazine spreads, newspaper spreads. Meanwhile, with public relations, what we're most focused in is how do we talk to publics directly? 
And so public relations takes on a kind of brand persona, a kind of company persona. It really is a company's opportunity to create a kind of personality that's a little bit more tangible for the public. If you think of um, dishwashing soap commercials with little ducks that are covered in oil and um, people are cleaning off animals from the oil and spillage going on, that's a paid form of advertising, but you could also kind of lump that in with corporate social responsibility, which is somewhat related to public relations. As you can see, things get pretty muddled and pretty messy really quick, and increasingly there is a blurred line between public relations and advertising. Moreover, in the age of big data in which all of our consumer imprints and footprints are being tracked by major corporations, they're learning more about the kind of advertising and public relations that we care for. They're learning about the kind of communication that we like. Traditional advertising has struggled a little bit in the digital age. Additionally, we know that with Facebook and with YouTube kind of getting into trouble surrounding reporting actual consumer engagement with commercials on each platform, there's a lot going on with how advertising and public relations are writing their own ships in order to be more impactful on consumers moving forward. Let's get started. So as we said earlier, advertising is an audio or visual message that deploys a commercial message to persuade consumers to purchase a product or service. And so it could be an advertisement for a car, it could be an advertisement for a toothbrush. Now, digital advertising revenue did grow by about 21% last year. That was back in 2017. This year, in 2018, it's been a little rocky for digital advertising because, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot going on with trying to track and measure actual consumer engagement. Are consumers watching these commercials? Are consumers actually... Let me... Um, can I cut that, Keith? There's a lot been going on with digital advertising as well. We know that it grew by 21% in 2017, but we know that this past year has been rocky. Facebook and YouTube have been asked to report actual consumer engagement, and they struggled with those numbers, and they've even misled investors. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to figure out, are people actually engaged by the commercials that they view online? Are they actually going out of their way to purchase products and services? So the root of all advertisements, at least the root of a really good advertisement, it is an attempt to make you feel a need or a desire, to recognize a need or desire, and then to try to fill that need or desire. Um, it does work on this premise that you have a problem or you're lacking something or you can improve upon yourself by getting or doing something. You know, remember at one point we didn't realize that we needed mouthwash and phones and cars or smartphones for that matter. And so it's important to recognize the power of advertising. It's meant to mobilize people. It's meant for you to recognize something that you need that you probably didn't know that you needed. It's a very, very difficult dance to have with consumers. Let's move along. Where do we see advertisements? We typically see advertisements all over the place. We see them on television. We see them on billboards. If you go to Times Square in New York City, there are advertisements galore. We see them all over the place. Some of you may feel inundated with advertisements in 2018. I know I do. If you click on a website, an ad pops up for uh, Dove Soap or an ad pops up for Tide. Anything like that constitutes advertising. And so online, not only do we have pop-up ads, we have banner ads that are typically at the bottom. We have side ads as well. Basically, we have ads all over the place. Soon we're going to have ads on our monitors and on our mouses and keyboards for that matter. But for now, they're relegated to the online screen itself. And so we're very much used to these forms of advertising, and we pretty much ignore quite a bit of them, actually. A lot of studies have found that consumers are not as engaged in advertisements, especially traditional advertisements, as once thought. And part of this is consumers' preferences. A lot of millennials, Generation Y, Generation Z, kind of moving down along the age spectrum, are more interested in companies that 
do social good. This gets into corporate social responsibility. Or companies that can actually prove or demonstrate some sort of authenticity. Um, survey after survey after survey for uh, a lot of market research firms have dictated that in fact millennials are most interested in companies that demonstrate a high level of authenticity. Being who you are, saying who you are, representing some sort of concept or idea is very, very attractive to younger generations. Let's move along. In order to better understand where and how we consume and process advertisements, the elaboration likelihood model is really, really good. So this model is fairly simplistic, but as we know, all simplistic models are the best models. We don't really look for complicated models in scientific research. We look for models that are clear and concise. And so this model assumes that regularities manifest in human behavior that can be discovered and understood. So some of us have an inclination to gravitate toward car commercials or cologne commercials or perfume commercials or toothpaste commercials. And so we have patterns as people surrounding how we process different kinds of advertisements from different kinds of product verticals. It assumes that people want to hold correct attitudes. We want to make sure that we interpret or process something in the proper way. We should all think that Sony, the brand itself, the tech brand itself, is hardcore hardware, that it's sophisticated, that it's reliable. We want to make sure we're all on the same page when we think of a particular brand. Persuasive messages can change or reinforce attitudes by impacting listeners' thoughts. So messages are persuasive if they create favorable thoughts. And so we all have a baseline, right? We all have this kind of perception surrounding how we perceive a brand. If we think about coffee, for instance, we might say to ourselves, well, I know A, B, and C about Starbucks. I know that the environment is inviting. I know that the coffee tastes really good. I know that Dunkin' Donuts, differently, is a place where you kind of come and go for your coffee as well. Um, you also need to consider people's motivations and capability to process information because it varies. And so some people will process a commercial differently than others. And we've seen this with a lot of Old Spice commercials for that matter. Those commercials tend to be funny, witty, and comical. And so for a lot of people, they tend to process those commercials in a very lighthearted manner. It considers, the model itself, considers the likelihood of participant elaboration over an idea. High elaboration engenders structured thinking based on data and logical reasoning. If I watch a commercial about insurance or investments and they're throwing numbers at me about how much I can invest and what percentage I can expect to get back, that's probably going to elicit high elaboration because I'm being given data, I'm being given a premise upon which to think logically about. That is insurance, that is investments. Items like that tend to summon high elaboration. Differently, when elaboration is low, when it is low to the ground, the information in a message is not considered carefully and thoughtfully. And so if we think of the Old Spice commercials, as I referenced earlier, you can kind of say to yourself, yeah, it's a commercial with a guy who's shaving himself, and then one of the hairs is the same dude, the actor being Terry Crews. And so I really can't elaborate on this too much. This is ridiculous. It's preposterous. There's nothing here about Old Spice. I don't know the ingredients. I don't know if it's effective. All I know is it made me laugh. And so for a lot of commercials, sometimes they play upon our heartstrings or our comedic timing or our comedic consumption for that matter. And they make us feel a certain way. They make us feel something without really filtering out what is it about the product that's good? What is it about the product that's bad, right? Not every commercial is like a medicine commercial in which they list all of the symptoms and all of the um, things that can happen if you take medication. Nausea, diarrhea, upset stomach, um, you know, falling asleep, or any of the other things that are some of the hazards in taking medication. Not all products are built that way. I know if I'm taking uh, a particular prescription from a commercial that I saw surrounding being able to sleep, 
and one of the issues is being groggy during the day, that's going to hit upon my data and logical reasoning impulses to say, oh, okay, I could fall asleep behind the wheel if I take this. This is kind of a high elaboration point because I'm dealing with data, I'm dealing with logic, I'm dealing with numbers, I'm dealing with a structured way of thinking. And if you look at those kinds of commercials for particular medications, they tend to elicit high elaboration, and they have to, because a lot of those medications, if not followed carefully, can lead to dire consequences. Differently with Old Spice, it's meant to make us laugh. And a lot of commercials out there will make us cry, make us laugh. There's no rational thinking incorporated. Why would they do that? Why would some commercials not want us to think critically? Could it be, possibly, that some of these commercials don't really want us thinking? Ooh. If they don't want us to think, what's really going on here? Do they want us to just laugh and cry and be happy and Identify them in a product aisle? Yeah, maybe. A lot of commercials tend to put together strategic communication in order to make us feel something. Not necessarily because the product is good or the service is of high quality. More so it's to ensure that when we're going down a product aisle and we see them on a stand to consider how we felt when we watched the commercial. It's a little bit easier to get people to think about their emotions than to rationalize. Another issue with rationalizing is if you rationalize and think too much, you might find a lot of flaws with something. This is typically what happens to a lot of us when we go on dates, right? We think about the person we're going on a date with. This is wrong. That's wrong. Wait a minute. What about this? What about this? What about this? Oh, oh, I'm not going to see her again. Ugh. And so for those very same reasons, it's important to make sure that we understand where advertisements are coming from and to make sure that we rationalize when we need to and that we emote when we need to when we watch commercials. But whether or not we fall into either category, to remember what's really going on here. To maybe give that girl a second shot as well. Let's go to the next slide. With ELM continued, consumers may use a central processing route Careful examination of the information. This is tied to high elaboration. So if we think about transitioning into a central route when we process information, that is tied to high elaboration. Differently for low elaboration, as we referenced earlier, that delves into a peripheral route. And again, we're not rationalizing what we're seeing. We're kind of just considering it at a low level. And so we're not scrutinizing the argument or evidence, as we said earlier with the Old Spice commercials. And so the manner in which somebody thinks, the situation and personality factors that are at play here also contribute to how people consume and process advertisements. Let's move along. Public relations. So public relations is different. It is different from commercial messages to audiences. There is supposed to be a mutual relationship that is struck between publics and an organization. So this is really an opportunity for a brand to become more humanized or employ narratives. And so it could very well be what some companies have done in the past here. For instance, uh, back in November, Starbucks put together a campaign interviewing veterans. Why would they do such a thing? Well, Veterans Day was in November. And so from September all the way through November, Starbucks had on its website, 1912 Pike, which is a subset of the Starbucks website, interviews with veterans and kind of reflecting on what it means to be patriotic, reflecting on what it means to um, be a war veteran. And so it's not necessarily advertising because we're not really talking about the latest peppermint mocha or the latest Americano or any other kind of coffee blend that's offered at Starbucks. Instead, what we're really trying to go after is what is Starbucks doing for society? How are they reaching out to people? Are they making a difference? Or are they just adding more milk to my coffee when I didn't ask for it? What is Starbucks doing to better connect with other people? And so public relations is a really great opportunity to kind of help shape your company in a different light that's not just the company, 
that it's a person, it's an image, it's an idea. It goes beyond simply asking somebody, buy my stuff! We're going past that. And instead, we're trying to build, consolidate, and maintain relationships. Let's go back to the slide. And so, if we think about what public relations may deal with, this also involves talking to journalists and reporters to write stories about their firms or the products that they cover. Third parties are often used to cover your company, independently verified. So it's this idea that companies can be independently verified and validated if somebody else is covering them. So for instance, if you Google Netflix and Orange is the New Black and New York Times, you'll see the New York Times did an article for Netflix is Orange is the New Black. And so this was an opportunity for Orange is the New Black to publicize itself and to give information about women's prisons. And so this was a really, really great public relations venture because it wasn't necessarily an advertisement for Orange is the New Black. It really did call attention to the atrocities and heinous actions that are regularly committed in women's prisons. And so public relations firms are responsible for handling good press. They're also responsible for handling bad press and crises as well. When there is an oil spill in the Gulf Coast or if there's some other environmental hazard that was caused by a company, public relations firms have to meet it. And it's very, very common for public relations firms to be at the forefront of these crises, answering questions, thinking of a strategy, and are trying to assess the relationship, right? If you break your girlfriend or boyfriend's favorite lamp, or if you do something bad, or anything else that we do in our daily lives when we're connected with people and have relationships, we have to repair them. Well, a public relations firm does the same thing. They work strategically to put out information through social media, online avenues, even traditional mediums as well, to help fix and repair a broken relationship with the public community as well. So those are really the two main, main differences between advertising and public relations. One is paid, one traditionally isn't, and one is trying to sell you on a particular need or desire that you have or you didn't know that you had. And meanwhile, the other is more interested in erecting and building a relationship with publics. And so these two forms of communication have worked hand in hand over the last 50 years or so, but there is a lot of overlap. And really, as technology and as other platforms consolidate and change and change the structure of how messages are disseminated out to the public, it's increasingly difficult to distinguish advertising and public relations, really. Let's move along. If we think about entertainment public relations, late night talk shows are the place for it. Placing plugs in for new movies and new television shows. There's coverage in Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, and other trade publications. It helps leverage equity behind actors and actresses. They're going out there as pitch people for their very own products, for the very own things that they created. We know that there is a halo effect here. In fact, if you like Matt Damon here, you're going to like the brand Matt Damon in another movie or in another TV show. And really, this is the fulcrum by which the public relations machine moves in the entertainment industry. If this Matt Damon movie was great, maybe I'll enjoy a leather jacket by Matt Damon or another movie by Matt Damon. And so it's this kind of reciprocal relationship in which consumers get to see the actual ingredients in a movie, namely the actors, the writers, the directors, and they get to see that right in front of them as a risk-reducing agent. And it serves as a catalyst to really motivate people to go see the movie. You're kind of getting a behind-the-scenes look, you're getting more information, you might watch a scene or two in late-night TV shows. And so from all of this, we get a better understanding of what the movie is about, and again, it serves as a risk-reducer. Let's move along. If we think about public relations, also, there's another angle to it. And I referred to this earlier as corporate responsibility or social corporate responsibility or corporate social responsibility is really what it's called. Corporate social responsibility deals with how companies reach out to consumers. And so social media is also exploited here to talk to consumers in real time. The goal here with corporate social responsibility is that it anthropomorphizes the brand. It gives it a voice, it gives it a personality. Coca-Cola isn't just a soda. 
It's a way for people to get together. It's a way for people to connect. And we saw this campaign a few years ago when they were branding Coca-Cola bottles with share a Coke with Anthony, share a Coke with David, share a Coke with Mary, personalizing these sodas. And so it allowed people to be able to buy somebody something with their name on it. So it helped give people a reason to buy Coca-Cola. It gave people to hang out with the people that they care about because if I'm going to buy a Coke for my brother Michael, I'll find a Coke bottle that says share a Coke with Michael and then have a kind of a funny moment and take pictures of it. Well, if you have enough consumers taking pictures with these Coca-Cola soda bottles, then you have a movement. And really, if it's on Instagram, if it's on Twitter, it can gain traction and it's a really nice way to conduct a public relations campaign that isn't necessarily paid advertising. You're just seeing people enjoying a Coca-Cola that has their name on it. It feels personalized. It feels like they're being thought of personally by the company itself. Companies and firms employing solid communication outreach and benefiting others. And so it helps boost their own brands because they're doing some sort of social philanthropy. And that's really the heart, the linchpin of corporate social responsibility. This kind of social philanthropy in which these companies are investing in communities to make them a better place. Well, that's all the time we have on Late Night Learning. Keep learning and laughing with Dr. Anthony Palumba. Thank you for coming and wishing you joy and peace.